Welcome to the first podcast for Module 3 on Family Dispute Resolution. First we will look at the objectives of these podcasts. At the outset, it's important to understand the emphasis in Australian family law on assisting clients to resolve their own disputes. This is particularly so in children's cases where it is acknowledged in the social science research that conflict is particularly harmful for children. There is also research to show that going to court increases conflict in the family. Uh, so that's really behind the emphasis in Australian family law on particularly um, requiring clients to go, for example, to mediation before filing an application in court for parenting orders. In line with this, it's really important that family lawyers be settlement focused and approach their cases in a collaborative manner wherever possible. It really makes a big difference uh, how family lawyers advise their clients initially and the approach that they advise their clients to take because that can really either inflame the matter and increase conflict if an adversarial approach is taken or on the other hand, um, although there may be some conflict there, um, create a better atmosphere, a more collaborative uh, atmosphere for settlement. In this first podcast, we will look at some of the key dispute resolution approaches available in family law. We'll also look at, um, in the second podcast, the legislative requirements that is set out in the, for example, Family Law Act uh, for pre-filing dispute resolution in parenting and financial cases. Uh, and we will look at a particular process called mediation that is becoming uh, more widely used in family law. It is a structured negotiation process. And we'll also look at uh, instances where mediation may not be appropriate because it's important for family lawyers to understand uh, what types of processes might be appropriate to refer their clients to. Now, I just wanted to point out at the beginning that we do have some uh, master's units that also run as short courses in uh, mediation and family mediation. We have family dispute resolution that runs as a master of laws unit and as a short course. We have mediation, which is general mediation in any type of law. Again, a master's unit and short course. Then we have two short courses, uh, a national mediation assessment course for people wanting to be nationally accredited mediators and a family mediation clinic. Now if in the future you wanted to become an accredited family mediator called a family dispute resolution practitioner, you would need to complete uh, 204 family dispute resolution, 206 mediation. You then need to complete uh, hours of supervised practice. You can either organise that, that yourself or you can undertake family mediation clinic which uh, assist you to complete your supervised practice. Uh, and then if you also want to become nationally accredited, on top of being accredited as a family mediator, you complete the National Mediator Assessment course. I'll put details of these courses on the website under Learning Resources. Now looking at the Family Dispute Resolution System. As we said at the beginning of this unit, uh, in family law there are federal and state laws. So we have federal courts being the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Magistrates Court of Australia and most matters now go to the Federal, I'm sorry I should have said Federal Circuit Court, so the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court, most matters go to the Federal Circuit Court. We also have state courts, um, Children's Court, Magistrates Court, where domestic violence, state domestic violence issues and child protection issues go. We have tribunals where some cases go, for example appeals against uh, child support assessments go to the Social Security Tribunal. Uh, then there is a whole range of services to assist people to resolve disputes outside of the court and for example 
where they can get help um, with initial information, uh, mediation services, and also uh, programs such as to support them for specific needs. For example, if they've been a victim of domestic violence, or if they've been a perpetrator, so there's support programs and help. And also other agencies such as the Child Support Agency and contact centres which um, deal with particular matters. Child Support now goes to the Child Support Agency. It's an administrative assessment and Chris Turnbull will be dealing with that in the module on financial support for children. And we will be talking about contact centres in this session. So you'll see there there's really been an evolution in the role of our family courts in Australia. And in 1975, the Family Court of Australia was also at that time had counselling facilities and conciliation facilities being a dispute resolution process and again a structured negotiation process to help with financial matters. Now as we've gone through the years, there have been amendments to the Family Law Act and each time the dispute resolution uh, processes and the emphasis have increased with each set of amendments to the Family Law Act. So I won't go through all of those amendments because um, some of them are quite historical now, but um, I guess in 2006 the Family Law Act was amended um, quite significantly and part of those amendments was to insert some compulsory pre-filing family dispute resolution in parenting disputes. Now we'll talk about that more in podcast two, but what it means is generally people must attend mediation prior to filing an application in court in relation to their children. And that's um, except if they fall within one of the exceptions. So we'll talk about the exceptions in podcast two. So the 2006 amendments were quite significant. They were also significant in the way that the court determines children's um, cases. And we'll be talking about that in the uh, children's module. Then in 2011, there were more amendments, uh, this time really focusing on providing greater protection for victims of violence and victims a little bit about uh, what types of disputes family law disputes are because they're really different to many other types of disputes. They involve uh, family members, particularly uh, for example husband and wife, de facto husband and wife, de facto same-sex partners and, and people who are parents of children and they also involve children and can involve other family members as well. So I guess uh, something unique about family law disputes is it involves people who have been in very close relationships. Uh, there can be quite high emotions. There can be very high conflict. People can have lots of history and sometimes uh, negative history, which can uh, sometimes make it difficult to get people to reach agreement. And I guess something that we really have to focus on as family lawyers is also where children are involved, trying to min minimise the conflict that children are exposed to. So I just wanted to talk about that at the very outset because it's something really important when we're trying to work out what's the best way uh, for, to, to advise a client in relation to how to approach uh, their particular issues, for example, if they come to you in an initial client interview. Now something that's also relevant in family law is the grieving process, and that's because often our client will be coming to us uh, when they've separ they may have recently separated, uh, sometimes they may not have, but uh, either they or their partner could still be grieving the end of the relationship. Now initially in family law, we really talked about this grieving process in relation to separation in terms of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross model. However, that, mo that model was um, design designed for people dealing with the death of a close 
uh, loved one. Her model is a, a linear model where people uh, go through certain stages and her proposal was that they uh, move from one stage onto the next. For example, firstly they're in denial, then they may experience anger, uh, then they might um, decide to do some bargaining, uh, then they may start to feel more and feel depressed and finally they come to a stage where they've reached acceptance. Now more recently uh, Robert Mayer who has written quite a, a number of texts in this area has come up with his own what he calls a cyclical model of grieving. Now have a look on the Blackboard site. I've uh, put a copy of his diagram uh, linked through the app. Now the difference with his model is it's specifically designed for family law disputes. And in his, he's proposing that people circle through uh, stages but then they continually go through the steps, the same stages, until finally um, the stages become uh, less significant. So it's not a linear model like the Kubler-Ross model. And I have to say it probably does make more sense in a family law separation sense. Particularly as in the Kubler-Ross model, if um, someone has died, you know that they won't ever be coming back to, it, to you. However, uh, when there's a separation, sometimes one or possibly both partners might be hopeful that the relationship uh, can be retrieved, that there can be a reconciliation. And sometimes, um, particularly if one client is hoping for this, but the other client has come to terms with the end of the relationship, it can make negotiations difficult. So I guess in terms of the grieving process, this is relevant too when we're trying to negotiate uh, agreements in a family law context. Because if one person is still grieving the end of the relationship and hasn't accepted that uh, the relationship is over, it can make it very difficult for them to come to terms with reaching an agreement, for example, about their children and particularly about their property because uh, that is often um, creates more finality, for example, selling their former matrimonial home and sometimes difficult for people to actually make and enter into that final agreement. Now in the textbook Family Law Principles we do have as a reading Chapter 4 which is the Family Law Dispute Resolution System. Now you should read through that chapter because it takes you through different types of dispute resolution processes that are available in family law in detail. So I won't be talking about all of them in detail, I'll just be highlighting uh, a few of them. But in this spectrum of dispute resolution I guess we are, um, it's a, a representation of these types of processes and we have for example court to the very right because it's a formal process it's expensive, a judge makes a decision and it can mean that there are very high level levels of conflict, particularly as it takes probably about 18 months to get a final hearing in court. Now at the other end of the spectrum we have processes that are more involving of the parties. Uh, for example, counselling, negotiation, mediation. And that's at the end of the spectrum where we're empowering the actual clients to either resolve the matter themselves, for example they can negotiate together, or to give them the help of um, third parties, for example a mediator who can assist them to talk about their issues and see if they can reach agreement. Now these types of options are generally less expensive, they're less formal, and they give the clients or the parties a chance to reach their own solutions. And I guess the research showed up, shows us that if people are able to reach their own agreements, 
that uh, they're more inclined to stick to those agreements and to carry them through. However, we have to acknowledge that in some cases it's just not possible for, um, for example, for clients to agree at a mediation. And there may be reasons why mediation isn't even appropriate. For example, if one party is really uh, hell-bent on getting revenge on the other party, they might just want to go to court and draw the case out as long as possible and cost the other party as much money as possible because that's really their underlying interest is retribution and to get back at the other person. So we really do as lawyers have to try and assess what might be the best options for our clients' particular cases. So setting out some of the main processes there, you will be able to read about them in that ch ch chapter of the text. I just wanted to point out, for example, in relation to family consultants, uh, if people do end up in court and say, for example, they've tried to sort things out but they can't, uh, once they get into, for example, the Federal Circuit Court, there will be a number of uh, processes to again give them a chance to come to an agreement with the help of a third person. For example, in a children's case, they'll initially get re uh, referred to a family consultant who may, if appropriate, also see the children. And that family consultant, who is a social scientist, a psychologist or social worker, will see if they, um, they can help the parents work out an agreement. And same with financial matters. There will be steps along the way to help people uh, resolve matters. It's only a very small percentage of cases that end up, particularly in a final hearing, in a family court. So a large part of what family lawyers actually are doing day to day is trying to settle cases, uh, negotiating, and also, for example, attending mediations or legal aid conferences. Although we have to recognise that court uh, usually is still part of each family lawyer's um, part of their work, however it might be a smaller proportion of the work than it was, um, say for example, 10, 20 years ago. However, I guess if you're wanting to um, practice in family law, you have to really be prepared to go to court as well as participate in all these dispute resolution. Uh, processes. Now family relationship centres are, um, there's a discussion of them in the case book which is very good if you've got a copy of that. They were established uh, with the amendments to the Family Law Act in 2006. They're community centres and they're intended to be a one-stop shop where people that are separating can go to to get some initial information, to get some help and to get referrals. For example, information seminars, uh, counselling, uh, mediation. So it was really to give people a central point uh, where they could seek some assistance and also to steer people away from uh, lawyers. Now I think um, this has worked to some extent and different people probably as a first port of call hook, hook, port of call, sorry, go to different places. Some people still probably go to lawyers as a first port of call because they want some legal advice. Um, but particularly for people that don't have a lot of money, um, the family relationship centres do provi provide good services. They're based out in the community. Uh, they're not located, say, in city centres. They're out in the suburbs. Um, and I guess it also depends uh, where you're living in Australia as to whether you can easily access them because if you're living in a regional area, um, they won't be available in all regional areas, although you might be able to travel to one, or also um, they would have an online call service. Now with help with mediation, um, the family relationship centres, some of them also do mediations, and there are community mediation centres such as Relationships Australia, Centre Care and Angler Care. There are also private mediators, who are lawyers or social scientists, uh, such as uh, Chris and myself, who are available uh, to help people sort out their arrangements, be it for children or for property. Um, and I guess the advantage of a private mediator is that you can access them more readily. 
some of the community providers do have very long waiting lists, although obviously um, the charge is higher for a private mediator. Now when we're talking about a mediation process, we're talking about a structured negotiation process. And this sets out an example of what's called facilitative mediation. Now, facilitative mediation is particularly appro appropriate in uh, family law matters because it really uh, involves a mediator who's not imposing any uh, views or suggestions about how a matter can be settled on the parties. We're just really helping people talk, uh, working out what the issues are, uh, coming up with an agenda, which is a list of common issues that the people want to discuss, working through the issues one by one, generating some options, and uh, if possible, reaching an agreement that can then be written up if the people want to more formally. So the defining features of facilitative mediation are that it's really about so, uh, party, what's called party self-determination. So it really puts the onus on the parties, so it'd be the husband and the wife or the mother and father. Um, to be assisted by a third p person to have discussions, but to come up with the options and solutions themselves. And this is the model that is used in community centres, and it can also be a model used by private mediators if they are trained in that particular model. And if you do any of the training uh, for family mediator accreditation, you will be trained in this particular model because that's the requirement. Uh, now there is another model of mediation and it's actually the most widely used model of mediation in family law. I guess this is because it's uh, something that lawyers feel comfortable with and that lawyers often get other lawyers to mediate and uh, I guess it's termed advisory mediation but it can be more like a shuttle negotiation and I should say with facilitative mediation uh, normally the parties and the mediator, and if they have lawyers, the lawyers would all be in the same room for most of the mediation. However, there would be times when the mediator might speak to clients and their lawyers separately. However, in an advisory mediation, often in practice, uh, mediators separate clients and lawyers from the very beginning. So in this model, lawyers would generally attend whereas in facilitative mediation, uh, say in community centres, they won't let lawyers attend. However, it's a if it's a private mediator, they can really decide whether they will let lawyers attend with the clients. So an advisory mediation is probably a shorter process. The lawyers might make opening statements and state their positions, whereas in a facilitative model, the parties make the opening statements the parties do most of the talking and the lawyers are there to help. In an advisory mediation, the lawyers do most of the talking and the mediator is also there to provide opinions about what might happen if this case goes to court. So I guess too an advisory mediation might be more appropriate when the matter has been going for a very long time without being able to be settled. There is very high conflict and it might assist the clients to have an independent third party such as a mediator gives some indication of what might happen if the case goes to court. And I've just put up a little bit of um, further information about advisory mediation there for you to read. Some people would argue it's not real mediation. I guess if you're in separate, media, um, separate rooms from the outset it really probably is more a shuttle negotiation process but very commonly used, and if you are working it in um, any area of law, you might be either participating in them already, or you might have um, gone along to one of them. So the key differences between facilitative and advisory uh, mediation is that in a facilitative mediation, the mediator is uh, more neutral. The mediator doesn't give opinions about what might happen if the case goes to court, or what might be a fair settlement outcome. For example, um, in an advisory mediation, the mediator might say, if this case goes to court and it's a family law property settlement, 
I think the husband will get 60% of the property and the wife will get 40%. That's really um, advising or giving some advice about what might be a possible outcome and will then influence the parties and the lawyers as to how they might settle. In a facilitated mediation, the mediator would not be offering those views. They would just simply be taking people through the process and seeing if they can come up with their own agreement, although giving them the structure in which to be able to do that. Now there are particular types of mediation uh, that are used in family law. Child focus mediation is where the mediator, it's a parenting um, dispute where people are trying to work out, for example, the time children spend with each parent. And the mediator uh, focuses the parties in this type of mediation on the best interests of their children and what parenting arrangements or what time they may spend with each parent that would be appropriate for their age, children's developmental needs, the child's personality, their lifestyle and family situation. For example, a particular, a particular child with their particular personality might not cope with a shared care arrangement where they're spending one week with mum and one week with dad. They may not cope with that sort of arrangement because they're a child that le needs a lot of structure. So child focus mediation doesn't involve the child in the actual mediation um, room. It's just really about, uh, from a conceptual basis, bringing the child into the room in constantly reminding parents to focus on their children's needs and to focus them on talking about their children and what might be the best outcomes for them. A child inclusive mediation on the other hand is about bringing the child into the mediation. However they don't go in with the mediator and the parents. They're actually seen by what is called a child consultant, a social science scientist, who speaks to the child or children separately and gets their perspective of what's going on. Now it really depends how old the children are and also whether they want to offer their views about what sort of parenting arrangements they would like. Uh, the child consultant is really their role is to work out how the child is going with the separation, how the current um, parenting arrangements are going for them and how they're coping. But if the child is old enough and wants to offer um, some views about what they think might be appropriate in terms of time they spend with mum and dad, uh, the family consultant can talk to them about that. The family consultant then goes into the mediation and feeds this back to the mediator and the parents. Now I guess it's important in this sort of process that there's an intake at the beginning to see if the parents and children will be suitable for this type of process. Because for example, if it's um, determined that parents wouldn't be able to, a parent or parents couldn't cope with the feedback from the children or might um, take it out on the children in a negative way they shouldn't be participating in this sort of process. The other thing a family consultant can do is be very careful about what information to feed back to the mediator and the parents. In some cases, um, Jennifer McIntosh, who is a clinical child psychologist who really, um, and I'm not sure if she originally came up with this model, but she has certainly come up with a model of child inclusive practice um, so, so the child consultant should be a very experienced and qualified professional and she recommends only a clinical child psychologist be a family consultant in this process. Um, however, I should say that that's not actually what's happening in practice around Australia. There are much lesser qualified people taking on these roles. But she also says to be careful about what information you feed back to the parents and what they can cope with. But I guess for an older child, um, particularly a teenager, they may, may feel very comfortable with um, their views being very clearly put forward to their parents. So it can particularly be a good process in that type of case. Now another process that is used in family law and is becoming more popular in Australia is what is called collaborative law. Now it originally came out of the US and Canada and I've actually got a DVT about this process on the Blackboard site. So if you watch that DVD, you will get a very good idea about what the process actually is. 
However, it's not a mediation process. It's a structured negotiation process that involves uh, the parties, that is, um, husband and wife, or um, same-sex parties, or parents. They uh, participate together in a series of meetings with their lawyers, like a round table meeting. And they can also have people like financial advisors, accountants, um, psychologists who may have been seeing the children involved in those meetings. Now there are quite a few family lawyers, um, for example in Brisbane, practicing in collaborative law. I guess for it to work, you have to, um, your client um, might want to do a collaborative law process, but then the other client also has to agree to a collaborative law process and to um, have a lawyer who has been trained in this process. But it can be a very good way to resolve um, issues in a low conflict way. And I guess this particularly seem to be good for property issues, particularly where there are complex property issues that need to be sorted out. Because you can also involve uh, financial advisors and accountants who, who can become very important, for example, where clients have companies and trusts um, with how to restructure after separation to minimise tax implications, particularly capital gains tax. And I've just given you some links if you want to have a look at that further in relation to what's happening with collaborative law. So make sure you watch the DVD, it will really explain that process well to you. Now for clients that are financially eligible, Legal Aid Queensland and uh, Legal Aid Commissions around Australia have a mediation style process available. So if you're financially eligible and also within the Legal Aid guidelines in that you're uh, type of case is the sort of case that legal aid is providing legal aid for. In family law they will initially give you legal aid for a legal aid conference which is a mediation process, a chairperson who will be a lawyer or social scientist or a co-chair of lawyer and social scientist will chair the conference and it's really based on um, I guess in a way on a bit of a combination between the facilitative mediation and the advisory mediation. At the end of the conference, the chairperson has to make recommendations that go back to the legal aid office and the grants officer, uh, and about, um, I guess, the legally aided client or client's merit for continuing legal aid. So they have to report back on the issues, uh, whether the case was resolved, if it wasn't resolved, whether aid should be granted to go to court. Now in Queensland, legal aid um, has been quite limited and it's now been cut back again uh, in this financial year. Uh, it is mainly for parenting issues. There is not very much legal aid for property issues and it's very restricted to people of very low socioeconomic means. Now also in family law, um, assistance for our clients is now not just uh, when they're trying to sort out agreements or when they're in court and trying to um, help them reach agreement without going to a court hearing. There are also um, there is also help post court order. So, for example, for people in high conflict, where they have had to go to court and get a judge to make a decision about arrangements for their children. They may be referred to what's called the Parenting Order Program. Now they attend this separately, the mother goes to a separate um, session to the father, but in those sessions uh, they really give an information about the impact of conflict on children and the importance of following their court orders and of how to try and cooperate with the other parent um, to put those orders and to make them work. Now contact centres are community based centres that have been established for again people in high conflict, particularly where there are allegations against one parent of domestic violence and abuse involving children. It may be assessed that the only appropriate contact a parent should have with their children is supervised and the contact centre provides supervision. However, there are very limited numbers of contact centres throughout Australia. 
I think in the Brisbane area there are only a couple and they're in the um, outer suburbs. They are very stretched in terms of resources and they sometimes have long waiting lists. So it can be very difficult where you're trying to negotiate parenting arrangements when there are allegations and particularly where one parent is insisting on supervised uh, contact or where it is very clear that supervised contact is the only op appropriate arrangement um, so that the children will be safe. Now I'll just very quickly talk about parenting coordination. Um, it comes from the United States. It's for people in very high conflict who, even after getting court orders, just can't resolve disputes that come up from time to time. For example, since their court orders, um, new issues may have come up. For example, where a child might go to high school, which they can't sort out themselves. They can appoint a parenting coordinator, who might be a lawyer or social scientist, who tries to um, help them negotiate, and then if they can't negotiate, makes a decision for them. Now, it hasn't been used that much in Australia yet, but has been used um, quite a lot in the United States. It uh, can be very expensive for parents, for example, parents paying this parenting coordinator at an hourly rate to help them sort things out and make decisions for them. And I guess um, probably it's a last resort for people that can't manage to talk together and work them things out themselves. Now, just a little bit more information there about contact centres and have a look at the link if you are interested. Contact centres can also be used for changeover. So, for example, when children are moving between their parents, uh, we normally talk, call that changeover. Now, for some parents, this is a very high, can be a high conflict time. If they don't get along and they can't control um, their emotions about each other, they can't control their conflict, changeovers can expose their children to some quite unpleasant um, experiences of parents yelling at each other, sometimes even um, violence being perpetrated. So contact centres can also be used by parents to change over. For example, uh, mum drops at the contact centre, drops the children, she leaves, dad comes to the contact centre and picks up so the parents don't have any contact with each other. However, again, uh, because of the long waiting list, can be hard to access and also be aware for supervision and changeover. There is a small fee at contact centres and the parties have to decide how they will pay that fee, whether one party will pay it or whether they will share the cost. Okay, so that's all for podcast two. I hope that gives you a bit of information about the different time types of dispute resolution processes in family law. And the next podcast, podcast two, will deal with the legislative requirements in this area, uh, the relevant sections and how they operate.